Good evening. My name is Ed McCartan, and I spent my career in the financial services industry beginning in 1974 at the newly formed Chicago Board Options Exchange as an independent floor trader. And then I moved on to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, where I served as a member of its Board of Governors. I spent the remaining years of my career <clears throat> in larger financial institutions like Solomon Brothers, J.P. Morgan, and Robertson Stevens, an investment bank on the West Coast that was owned by a large regional bank in the Northeast. Tonight I'd like to speak to you about what actually brought us to this point in the banking crisis and how it is that we've somehow lost control over organizations that for most of the 20th century were very highly regulated because of the sensitivity of the business to the conduct of our, of our economy. What led us here? First and most importantly is a failure to enforce the regulations and even the laws of the land as it pertains to financial services. Regulations aren't particularly helpful if you have regulators who either don't have sufficient personnel to enforce the rules or who have no interest in doing so. I'd like to start with the Federal Reserve Board. The Fed has great powers, perhaps more than any other regulatory body in the financial services industry. It has charged, it has been charged with the uh, supervision not only of the banks under its jurisdiction, that is the large national banks, the smaller regional banks are governed by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. But the big banks, the ones that are conducting enormous um, underwriting activities and, and swaps market activity, are Fed-governed. The Fed had power over the mortgage market, but it opted not to do anything about it. And it wasn't until quite recently that we began to understand some of the philosophy behind it. It is specifically now known that Alan Greenspan, the chairman for a very long period of time and under several administrations, was a big believer in the philosophy of Ayn Rand, the philosophy of objectivism. And fundamentally, Ayn Rand was very much interested in the power of the individual over that of the collective, and specifically very, very much opposed to any form of regulation which she thought, saw as thwarting the ambitions of entrepreneurial people and those with great drive. And this is something that sank into Greenspan at a fairly young age and carried with him throughout his professional career. The fact is that the Fed had the ability to go in and audit the banks and say, tell us what your lending standards are. How are you making decisions about who gets loans and who doesn't get loans? They could oversee the, the market and, and securities which were being backed by mortgages. They did none of it. You take the look at the SEC. The SEC has had in place since 1933, with the Securities Act then, of governing the capitalization of broker-dealers. And one of the lessons of the 1929 crash was that there was way too much debt in the system, and that they needed to make sure that there was a reasonable amount of capital in these firms to support the volume of the transactions that they were doing. So they set a rule and said, at a minimum, the net capital requirement for broker-dealers says you can't have more than 10 to 1 leverage. In other words, you can't have more than $10 of debt for every dollar of capital that you hold. And if you happen to be a really, really small broker-dealer who wouldn't have a big impact on anyone, they would allow you an alternative calculation of 15 to 1. When Bear Stearns failed, its leverage ratio, debt to equity, was 42 to 1. Lehman Brothers, when it failed, was about 40 to 1. These were far in excess of both the statutory requirements as well as common sense. What happened along the way? 
This is what we refer to as regulatory capture, where a regulator basically begins to act in the interest of those parties which it regulates. In the late 1990s, when Hank Paulson, the subsequent Secretary of the Treasury, was head of Goldman Sachs, he led a delegation of the investment banks down to talk to the SEC. They were very concerned at the time about the inroads that commercial banks were making into their business. Generally speaking, the commercial banks were a lot larger, they were better capitalized, they had very large customer bases that overlapped with the investment banks. So the investment banks were beginning to fear for their future, and they felt that they needed to have more room to be able to conduct more business. So they went to the SEC and said, look, we need to have relief from these minimum net capital requirements, and we'd be happy to do it if you want to come and audit us to make sure that we're doing this in a responsible way. So they came to this agreement in spite of the fact that the regulations are clear about the net capital requirement, and they were granted this authority to expand. How many audits were conducted on these firms in the wake of this agreement? None. Not once. Lo and behold, we have these two firms swell up to unmanageable size and ultimately collapse because they're incapable of being able to support the risk that they've taken. What else happened? Securitization. Securitization is essentially taking an asset like a mortgage or a package of credit card debt, packaging it up into a security, and then selling that security to investors. This is one of the big, big problems that we saw that developed from 2005 up to 2008. There were, these are periods where interest rates are very low, Investors are concerned about getting a much higher rate of interest on their investment portfolio, and they weren't getting it in the, in the U.S. Treasury market. They weren't getting it in the stock market. And suddenly there was something very attractive as an alternative, which was to buy securities which were backed by pools of mortgages. This was very attractive to the mortgage originators because they could go, could go out, create pools of mortgages, bundle them together, sell them and get them completely off their books. They had no remaining risk of those mortgage borrowers, so they didn't particularly care very much about the standards of lending to them. As soon as you securitize these mortgages and sell them off, you don't care. And you go back and start the process all over again. There seemed to be a great deal of enthusiasm for buying these securities, and the Wall Street banks were eager to satisfy them. But because you don't carry any further risk, you didn't pay a lot of attention to who was getting these loans. And this is what we started to refer to as the subprime mortgage market, that loans were being made to people in amounts that they really couldn't afford, and then the risks were kicked down the road. They had the ability to be able to sell these securities because we had the ratings agencies like Moody's and Fitch and Standard & Poor's being compromised by a conflict of interest. If I were bringing a security back by mortgage pools, I need to get them valued. Investors don't just buy anything. They have to know what is the rating of the security because certain institutions cannot buy anything rated below A. You have to know what the rating is. So the originator of the security goes to a ratings agency and says, here are the models that I use to value this security. Take a look at it, rate it, and we will pay you for the service. Therein lies the problem. If you really want to get the payments from those originators, you're not going to get a lot of business if you keep on being negative about what they bring you. And in essence, we wound up with a lot of ratings on pieces of paper that were to collapse within a few years after they were originated. Another problem is the excessive influence that the banking industry has on our political process. 
Senator Dick Durbin, the, my senator from Illinois, who's the minority whip in the Senate, was recently quoted as saying that the banking industry lobby is the biggest in Washington, and quite frankly, they own us. That's a remarkable admission for someone in public office to, to state. But to put some numbers on that, as I promised that I would do, between 1998 and 2010, the banking industry spent $48 billion in an effort to lobby the members of Congress to pass legislation which, which they wanted to see done. That is an average of $7 million per member over those 12 years. That's a big lobby. That's a lot bigger than big pharma. It's a lot bigger than the defense contracting business. And you can extract a lot of attention if you've got lobbying teams working Capitol Hill every day that the House and Senate are in session. And they were able to persuade the Congress to pass two very important pieces of legislation. One is the modification of the Bankruptcy Act, which effectively makes it much harder for any consumer who's got a bad mortgage problem or a student loan problem to be able to go to a court and ask for relief, to get a payment system going, to be able to work your way out of excessive debt. The banks didn't want that. They wanted to make sure that as soon as you were in an obligated position, you were not going to be able to get off the hook. Now, ultimately, this redounded not to their benefit, but to a real problem when mortgages began to be foreclosed. As in the past, if you had a problem with being able to pay your mortgage and you went into a bankruptcy court, the judge would probably get the bank to agree to a lower payment so you could stay in your home and work your way through it. In the wake of the new bankruptcy law, it was easier to put your house keys in an envelope and mail them back to the bank and walk away, what we now call jingle mail. Secondly, the other piece of legislation was the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act of 1999, and it did one very important thing. It eliminated the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933. That act had separated investment banking, which is underwriting and securities trading, and all the risks associated with that business, from federally insured commercial bank deposits. So back in the day, J.P. Morgan was required to divest its investment bank, which then became Morgan Stanley and Company Incorporated. Banks and investment banks were split, and they could not get back together again. The legislation in 1999 ended that. The commercial banks got into the securities business in a big, big way. There were also extraordinary risk management problems inside these entities. There were very poor risk modeling. One, if you're going to, if you're going to create a security, you need to understand where the hidden risks in that security are. As a trader, I certainly would. I'm not going to buy anything that I don't understand. I, if I don't understand how it's going to perform, there's no price at which I'm going to be prepared to buy it. But when these mortgage-backed securities were being constructed in order to sort of analyze what would happen in the future if market prices were to vary, they started to rely on recent price history. That's kind of a traditional approach. To think about what might happen in the future, you would tend to look in the past. Except that when they looked, they looked back five years, and in some cases they were rigorous, and they looked back ten years. And guess what? Those five-year and ten-year periods were among the strongest bull markets in real estate in the history of the United States. So your models are confined to looking essentially only at bull markets without a consideration as to what happens if housing prices plunge. In other words, garbage in, garbage out. You use bad data or inappropriate data, your risk models are going to be worthless. And that is why when real estate prices topped out 
and began to fall, there were some very, very unexpected consequences for mortgage-backed securities in which some of them collapsed in six months. They went from being A-rated or AA-rated to being absolute junk, 20 cents on the dollar. Furthermore, it's not even clear that the paperwork was done properly. The typical way that you deal with a mortgage-backed security when you put it in a pool is to take the pool, you give it to a trust company, the trust company warrants that the mortgages are actually there, and then once those claims have been made, the security is issued along with the prospectus, and the buyer feels like they've been fully satisfied. But it now appears from recent court cases that in many cases, the mortgages that were given to the trust were improperly conveyed and that they don't actually have legal title, in which case these trusts can't make the claim that you have good claim on those mortgages, and it further complicates how you would ever sell those properties. Who has the need? Who has the deed? Who has the title? I mean, the, the disruptions from bad paper processing could have knock-on effects that last for years in this market. And finally, this is sort of endemic, endemic to what happens in the credit markets. Groupthink. We've had a herd mentality that's appeared over and over again during my professional career where lending problems occur in big clumps in the same place. We've seen this happen over and over again. In the early 19, or excuse me, in the late 1970s, there was a tremendous surge to make loans to domestic oil producers. We just had gone through the oil price shocks. Oil prices were triple or quadruple what they had been at the beginning of the decade. Everyone thought, this is a great place to lend. You know, oil's going to do one thing. It's going to go straight up. The banks jumped into making a lot of loans down in Oklahoma and Texas and other oil-producing regions. And then oil prices went down. And the collapse of Penn Square and its affiliate banks in Texas took down Continental Bank of Illinois and threatened a lot of other financial institutions that had made the mistake of following Continental Illinois into the oil patch to be able to profit from the same seemingly no-lose loans. Then commodity prices started to take off in the middle 70s. It became very, very popular to lend to buy agricultural land. It was a great deal to go out and buy, you know, corn growing cropland in Iowa and soybean cropland in Illinois and wheat fields in, in the uh, Middle Plains. Again, these prices were going up by 20 percent, 30 percent a year. And again, by the way, this, this bubble is in the process of reflating right now. So agricultural lending was all the rage until commodity prices collapsed and land prices went right back to that where they were at the very beginning. Then we had a real estate crisis. The savings and loan industry got completely out of control in the Southwest. From Arizona to California, there was such a massive implosion of real estate prices that in many of those locations, home prices fell by half in a very short period of time. But remember, that's ancient history. That's 1986. That could never happen again, right? Then once we got through that crisis, the banks found it very profitable to make loans to developing sovereign countries that had commodity price supports that were oil-producing states where suddenly they became the next place to make a lot of loans. That patch of lending went very, very bad. And then, having not learned the lessons of all jumping into the same types of loans so that when problems develop, you have not one or two banks, but lots of them trying to get out of the same place at the same time, it always lends to a market overreaction. And in fact, I think that apart from agricultural lending, that student loans might be the very next big thing that's going to hit the banks. This is a market that used to account for about 
$50 billion per year in loan origination. That number's now $100 billion a year in just the last 10 years. And the total amount of student loans that are outstanding itself is a trillion dollars. These are not small numbers. I mean, each of you singly thinks about your student loan obligations, but collectively, this is an enormous pool of credit risk.